I sat motionless, paralyzed, while my wife of twenty-five years explained to me why she was serving me with divorce papers. I only heard half of what she said. Gary, are you listening to me? You look like you're in a daze. Pay attention. Okay, it is very important. Sorry, I got distracted for a minute. What were you talking about? The conditions are simple. There is nothing to dispute. I'm not asking for anything. Can you hear it? Absolutely nothing. You keep the house, cars, and all the money in the bank. If you sign this, it will all be over in three months. I didn't know what to answer. Marcy and I have been married since high school. We raised two beautiful twin daughters. Cindy and Sandy attended Columbia University studying international banking. We had a nice house in the suburbs, and we both drove a Volvo. Marcy had her own credit cards and cell phone. I didn't refuse her anything. Never cheated on her or abused her verbally or physically. She never showed that she was unhappy and did not complain about anything. There was no way I could have prepared for this. I never noticed anything was wrong. Maybe that was the problem. I wasn't paying enough attention. I understand the mechanics of divorce, Marcy. But could you tell me why? It's probably too late to do anything. But I'd like to know why Marcy seemed to slump on the kitchen chair. It was clear that she did not want to discuss the reasons and hoped that I would just sign the papers and let her go. Just give me the short story, Marcy. What the heck did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong, Gary. You were the perfect husband. Sometimes I hoped that you would screw up and give me a reason to leave. But that never happened. You've done a great job raising your kids and getting them into college. You always gave me everything I wanted, even if sometimes I was unreasonable. You bought me a wonderful house my parents love. You never think that you did something wrong because you didn't do it. She looked good for 45 years old. She had a pleasant complexion and perfect hair. They were light brown and the highlighted strands glistened in the sun. She jogged regularly and her body was toned and tanned. On weekdays, she looked like a girl from Land's End, but when needed, she was glamorous. Marcy was just as perfect as I was, just like she claimed. I just couldn't understand what caused this. Sorry, it does not make sense. There must be a reason. You can't say everything is fine and then walk away. There must be a reason, Gary. I'm trying to do this without hurting your feelings or making a fool of myself. Maybe we can leave everything as it is. No, Gary. I found someone else. He's a developer. He has a beautiful apartment overlooking the river and a beautiful black Mercedes. He is handsome, rich, and madly in love with me. You have always been, and remain a seller in a supermarket. I'm not disparaging your work, because you always took care of us and always earned enough to make the family comfortable. But you will always be a grocery seller. I wanted more. I couldn't imagine that you would do this for me. You were always content with what you did and I didn't see you trying to improve. It was painful. I was a product manager, and she still thought of me as a clerk when I had a chance to advance my career and move out of town. I turned down the opportunity to save my family, and now look at how I was rewarded. I was in pain, but there was no need to remind me of that. Does this rich, handsome guy have a name? Clayton Manning. He is the president of Keystone Development. How long have you known him? Six months. Did you sleep with him? Marcy sat up straighter in her chair. Her eyes darted around the room, and finally she looked at my face. Yes, I tried to avoid this topic. But since you insisted on bringing it up then, yes, you were still married? Yes, I was still married. I cheated on you. I was an adulteress. Are you happy now? I sat there for a moment, and then reached over and took the divorce papers, signed in three places, initialed in two, and slid them across the table to her. I think he's a better man than me. Sorry for the disappointment. I stood up, and as I was leaving the room, Marcy screamed, No, damn it. That's not the reason. He wasn't better than you. Just different. Don't you dare leave believing this, Gary. Don't you dare. By that time, I was already out the door. I was so immersed in work and hobbies that I didn't even notice how Marcy was gradually moving her things out of the house. By the time she handed me the papers, she had moved most of her clothes and personal belongings into Clayton's apartment. She thoughtfully left all the wedding and family photos so that I could enjoy them in her absence. When I returned to the house, she was no longer there. Her Volvo was still in the driveway, 
and I decided she wouldn't need it anymore. She left the power of attorney for the sale of the house and car on the kitchen table. I spent the rest of the evening getting rid of the beer that was in the refrigerator. By this point, I decided it was all over. There was no turning back, and I had no desire. Marcy is gone, and will never be there. The next morning, I called work and took three months of overdue vacation. They were constantly nagging me to take time off, so there was no problem. I had enough vacation and sick leave. I quickly called the girls at college and briefly explained that we were breaking up, but refused to give them any other information. They wanted to call Marcy, but I didn't have her new phone number. I had three months to gather my strength and decide what I was going to do. I turned off my landline. I changed my cell phone number and canceled the one Marcy had. The Volvo dealer gave me a low book value for Marcy's car. I had a high school friend, Terry Davis, who was now a real estate broker. He agreed to sell the house without an advertisement at a low price and with a quick settlement. Just to be sure, I canceled all the credit cards and opened new bank accounts. I cashed in life insurance policies. It's time to clean up the house. Having examined the entire house, I collected everything that could belong to my wife. There was enough stuff to fill three garbage bags. I packed the girls' personal belongings into boxes and moved them to a warehouse next to the house. Then, he spent three hours sorting family photos. I put all the girls' photos in a box for them. All pictures from Marcy went into the trash bin. I know it was childish, but I didn't give a fudge. The big problem for me was the lack of direction. I had no idea what I would do. After three months was up. Will I stay here, or will I leave? Will I continue working, or will I find something new? I had two hobbies. I collected coins. Mostly Indian had pennies. They were easy to assemble and readily available. I bought and sold them on eBay, and had fun doing it. My second passion was geocaching a tourist game using satellite navigation systems consisting of finding caches hidden by other participants in the game. It gave me a reason to get outside and get some exercise. Marcy hated this activity because of the ticks, poison ivy, and having to walk. I couldn't imagine how I could make a living with any of my hobbies when I wasn't pursuing my hobbies. I spent time reading the Wall Street Journal. Cindy and Sandy gave me a subscription every year for Christmas. I wasn't interested in stocks and bonds, but I read everything about farm commodities. I knew more about sugar, wheat, and corn than most market analysts. Of course, it was just a hobby. I didn't put any money into it. I have researched all available information about Keystone Development and Clayton Manning. Terry Davis was able to obtain more information about Clayton and his current project than I did. He double-checked some of the information with his friend at one of the local commercial banks. I was looking forward to seeing what he would come up with. Seven weeks have passed. All this time, I did not see Marcy or hear from her. The girls called every week, but there was no news from their mother either. I had a feeling they were on my side. But Marcy was their mother, and I'm sure they had to support her to some extent. I held several yard sales and unloaded a ton of stuff. I left enough furniture in the house so that it could be shown well to any potential buyers. A photograph of Marcy and Clayton appeared in the social section of the Sunday newspaper. They were at a political rally drinking wine with local bigwigs. Several more weeks passed. Terry made me an offer on the house. It was quite low compared to the estimate, but they wanted to close the deal in 60 days, which would be ideal. He had some interesting information about Clayton and wanted to talk about it. We agreed to meet for lunch. I decided to leave the house for a while. I needed a break. Mount Hayes was one of the best places in the area for hiking and geocaching. Unfortunately, I found all the hiding places there. However, there were three landmarks on the mountain. Landmarks are control points placed throughout the country by the government. Surveyors and land surveyors use these landmarks to determine property boundaries. They come in different types but are usually metal rods driven into concrete. Finding landmarks is an interesting side game for serious geocatchers. I decided that today I would be able to find all three landmarks on the mountain. In addition to the jeeps, I would have to take a metal detector with me. Finding a piece of rebar in the forest is not easy, and I needed some help. Jeeps will help me get to the approximate area. Most of Mount Hayes belong to Madison Land Trust. Its area approached 2,000 acres, but they constantly sought to expand it. 
subdivisions, and industrial parks occupied much of the vacant land, and the trust had to survive on donations. Next to the trust car park was an orchard and farmhouse, with a large sign for sale. After parking the car, I walked up to the fence near the orchard just to have a look. It seemed shameful to think that after some time, this beautiful estate would probably be bulldozed to make way for progress. Are you going to buy it, or are you just looking? I couldn't help but smile at the elderly man who was walking towards me. He was wearing overalls and a John Deere baseball cap instead of a straw hat. He introduced himself as John Smart. Well, if I had a million, I would be more than happy to take it from your hands. We both laughed about it. You probably won't have any problems with the sale. Well, I have people interested, but I'm trying to hold out as long as possible. Why? I was hoping the land trust would buy it, but they can't seem to find the money. They want to leave the fruit trees in their natural state, which is fine with me. Developers don't like this because they want to ruin everything. I think this will be a great addition to what we have now. How can the land trust compete with large companies? I offered them a better deal. In the catalog, it is sold for a million, but I will give it to the trust for 600000 The trouble is that they cannot collect this amount right now. If they can't do it in 90 days, I'll have to take the option back from the darn developer. This son of a jerk calls me every week and I'm tired of him. An option is not a sale, right? No. The buyer acquired from me a promise to sell him the land in the next six months for $1 million. He pays 100000 for the option. If he fails to raise a million, he loses the option payment. It's a good deal for me, but I don't want him to get it. He has a million fixed, so he will be safe. The problem is that he needs to get all six properties for the deal to go through. That's why he's willing to pay more than the place is worth. What will happen if you don't sell him the option? He'll lose his assets, his fixation, his shares, and his foundation. With the land trust unable to raise money, Keystone appears to have a good chance. However, if he doesn't get the plot, he will lose the entire deal, including the money he paid for options on the other five plots. It's probably around a million. His investors will walk away and leave him in limbo. If I had money, I would help you. Yes, that's what they all say. We laughed again, and I went for a walk. I found his mention of Keystone. Interesting. The landmarks were a mile apart. It was as the crow flies on the mountain. It was twice as much. The first two landmarks were fairly easy to find and were standard surveyor's markers. The last mark was much older and much more difficult to find. When I finally came across it, I found a small brick monument with a bronze plaque attached to it. It was buried under perennial leaves and debris. I took a photo of it to publish in a magazine. That's when my life changed. The metal detector was still on. When I moved away from the marker, it began to squeak. It was weak, but it was definitely there. I put on my headphones and began scanning the area about ten feet south of the landmark. Finally, I aimed it at the target and carefully began to probe. You don't usually find metal in the middle of the forest. Five minutes later, I had a small iron box in my hands. It was wrapped in a heavily oiled piece of canvas. There was a lot of rust on the surface, but the box itself was solid. The lock was made of heavy bronze, but it still did its job quite often. Fines of this nature on public lands are considered treasure and should be turned over to the government or some historical agency. For some reason, this option didn't make sense to me today. I put the box in my backpack and headed home. On the way home, I couldn't help but think about what was in my little box. Gold coins are the first thing that came to mind. Perhaps it was full of important documents from the Civil War or earlier. The possibilities were limited only by the size of the container. I cleared the kitchen table, took out Foster's This the World's Most Popular Australian Beer, and studied his find. I didn't want to destroy the lock, but I couldn't figure out how to open it any other way. I had no idea if the mechanism inside the lock was still functioning. I decided that the castle would have to be sacrificed. My bolt cutter got the job done quickly. Inside the box was another piece of waxed canvas. I carefully unfolded it and found twelve pennies. Why would anyone bury twelve pennies? These were not ordinary everyday pennies, but big old ones. Since the most recent date is 1840, the oldest is 1793. 
despite their age, the date on each of them could be easily read. Surprisingly, they did not show the green corrosion that is often found on older copper coins. I have never been into collecting large cents because I thought I could get more for my money by buying newer ones sent with the head of an Indian. However, I had a book that my grandfather left me called Penny Quirk's Lie. It talked about the different types and varieties of large cents. I found it boring because I didn't have any of them. It sat on a shelf collecting dust for almost thirty years. It will be put to good use tonight. I sat until dawn with my grandfather's book and magnifying glass. My scanner took beautiful, high-resolution photographs of each coin. Every crack and scratch on the die was clearly visible, and the condition of each coin was obvious. I slept until noon. I called work to see how things were going. I was told that Phil Williams, one of the company's executives, had asked about me. They didn't know anything else. I had other concerns, so I did not develop this topic. A trip to the bank was necessary to obtain a safe deposit box. After spending a few hours on the internet, I realized that my pennies were worth several million dollars. It was not a matter of age, but of their condition and types of stamps. Now I understood why traffickers of illegal substances had to make so much effort to launder money. There was no easy way to turn my precious coins into hard cash. We'll have to work hard while eating breakfast at IHOP. I noticed another photo in the newspaper of Marcy and Clayton at the opening of a new art gallery. She was wearing a black cocktail dress, and in her hands she was holding a glass of wine or champagne. They both smiled at the camera. My next step became clearer in my mind as I looked at the photo after receiving the safe deposit box. I called John Smothered and asked him to hold off on making any decisions about the land for a few days. He seemed pleased with the call. I went to the land trust office and asked for information on how to make a donation to the organization. They were very happy to help me. There were four weeks left before the final divorce. For some reason, I felt that this deadline was very important. I spent the rest of the day researching coin dealers and auction houses. I was not looking for advertising, but for litigation. In the end, I settled on the company Towers and Burns in New York. They were in a strong financial position and seemed able to handle a controversial sale without too much trouble and without too much publicity. I made an appointment with them on Monday afternoon. I called the girls and asked them to leave Monday morning free so we can have lunch together. Office Facade, Towers and Burns was a luxurious showroom. There was a lot of glass and light. The display cases contained the standard variety of collectibles, and the walls were covered with other numismatic paraphernalia. I gave my last name and was shown to a much less attractive part of the building. Welcome to New York, Mr. Simmons. I understand that you have some interesting copper that you want to show us. Are you new to the city? I sat down in a straight-back chair opposite James Towers. His photograph was in the advertisement, but now he looked ten years older. Thank you. My daughters attend Columbia University, so I've been here before, but never on business. I'm not questioning your knowledge of coins, but do you have anyone on staff who specializes in early copper coins? If so, I think their presence would be helpful. I'm not that arrogant, and I also think it would be a good idea. He leaned toward the intercom on the table. Marie, let Cookson come into my office. Maurice Cookson has published several guides to major saint and half cents. I was pleased with its availability. Mr. Cookson also looked older than his photographs. I don't think anyone likes looking old, gentlemen. I have twelve special coins that I offer for sale. I hope to sell four of them today and leave the fifth for your consideration. I'll save the other seven coins for later. If everything goes well today, I will offer them to you too. I know it seems incredible, but I think that six coins will fall under the status census of state. I'm sure Mr. Cookson will determine whether I'm close or not, since cents from census of state don't come on the market very often. I was hoping you might be interested. Where do these coins come from? My grandfather left them to me when he died. I don't want to offend you, Mr. Simmons, but this story is hard to believe. What do you want to show us? I laid out four photographs on the table. Each one featured the obverse and reverse of one of the coins I was offering today. They were about five times the normal size, and very clear. 
James and Maurice looked at each photograph for several minutes. Finally, James spoke. What do you want for these four? Having briefly looked at the results of the latest auctions, I came to the conclusion that they could fetch about 1,300,000. I thought about 100. But your figure is not excluded. Maurice really knew his pennies. I only want 800,000 for the lot. But it must be decorated in a special way. James leaned back in his chair and smiled. I think we can handle it. What special method are you talking about? I had a letter that I picked up from the land trust that explained how to donate the land. I gave it to Mr. Towers, along with an advertisement for the sale of John Schmerda Orchard. I want you to buy this piece of land and give it as a gift. Land. Trust, Madison. The price is $600,000. You will get a very good tax deduction and become humanitarians. I'll take the rest of the money in cash. Give us a minute, please. James and Maurice went to the other end of the room. A few minutes later, Maurice left. James returned to the table. Do you have any coins with you? Yes. I also have a fifth coin that I would like to leave with you. Mr. Cookson returned to the table with a purple crown royal bag. This time he said, We are ready to fulfill your conditions for the first part of the deal and hope that you can fulfill ours for the second part. He then dumped the purple bag onto the desk. It contained almost a hundred different coins, mostly gold but there were also silver ones. The retail price of this collection is close to 300000 For a number of reasons that we will not discuss, it is difficult for us to sell them. However, you won't have any problems. I understand that you have already sold coins on eBay. This is true, I simply nodded. These coins, which you inherited from your grandfather, should be easy to sell, and we will both benefit. I assure you that you will not have any difficulties. This was said with a slight wink. I thought about it a bit and agreed. I handed four pennies to Mr. Towers, and we all shook hands. Now, Mr. Simmons, tell us about this fifth coin. I held the photograph in my hand and looked at Mr. Cookson. What was the highest rating for Strawberry? Nickname of the coin is Strawberry. 1793 that you've ever seen. I've actually never seen a Strawberry like this, but I think the highest rating is fair. 12. I rated it a good eight, but I'm not a professional. He didn't look at the photo. He looked at my face when I said it. Both tried to look at the photo at the same time. Cookson smiled widely, and I saw dollar signs in Tower's eyes. How many? The best offer is, if you can figure out how to pay me. Would you like a cup of coffee, Mr. Simmons? Of course. Black will be just right. They both left the room with the photo, and a few minutes later, the young woman brought me a cup of coffee. Mr. Towers will be with you in a few minutes. He needs to make some phone calls. Will you be okay? I nodded affirmatively and began to enjoy my coffee. Thirty minutes passed when Towers returned to the room with an absolutely beautiful lady. She had dark eyes, black hair, and appears to be of Middle Eastern descent. I guess that she was no more than thirty. She was well-dressed and carried herself confidently. For a second, I thought I recognized her, but I couldn't remember where. Hello. My name is Letitia Rothberg. Do you have a passport, Mr. Simmons? Her voice was deep, but still feminine. Yes. Fine. We'll be flying to Kennedy soon to open a new offshore bank account for you. Do you have anything to tell Mr. Towers? I handed James a 1793 strawberry, and he looked like a little boy at Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, he said, leaving the room. We never agreed on a price, but I still had seven coins that Towers wanted. Mr. Towers agreed to hold the small bag of coins until I returned. An hour later, we were already on the plane flying to the Cayman Islands. She hardly spoke when we arrived at the airport. Several photographers were persistently trying to photograph her. She looked annoyed, but at the same time she smiled sweetly. I had no idea what the reason for this interest was. It was my first flight in first class, and it ended too early. A bright yellow mini SUV was waiting for us at the terminal. My owner didn't hesitate to hike her skirt up to her hips as she slid into the driver's seat. To my embarrassment, she caught me sneaking a look at her tanned legs. She seemed amused by my discomfort. Twenty minutes later, we parked on the lower level of a mid-sized condominium building. Letitia Rothberg owned the entire building, but she had her own private apartment on the top floor. 
Can I get you anything, Mr. Simmons? Beer would be nice. The view of her leaving the room was as good as the glimpse of her legs in the terminal. It's not in my nature to stare at young women, but Letitia Rothberg was special. We walked out onto a small balcony overlooking the ocean. It was beautiful there, but the wind was too strong for my taste. She was probably trying to impress me with the grandeur of the place. It was nice, but I was more interested in the new bank account I was getting. You don't talk much, Mr. Simmons. Surely you have a few questions that you would like answered. It seemed strange to me that a woman of her class and position should drink beer from a bottle. I could imagine her sucking champagne or martini, but not beer. She won't have this figure for long if she continues. Usually I think it's better to wait, but I suppose you could tell me why we needed to come here to open a bank account. This is a simple, reliable, and safe place to receive money. I think it will be good for you. It's just one coin. Yes, but you have seven more. Sorry, but this still seems excessive. To my delight, we returned inside, away from the wind. Can you accept this? I brought you here to become my slave for a few days. I have to admit that the unexpected comment made me smile. I automatically knew it was nonsense, but I still found it funny. She had a sense of humor. She was beautiful and rich. What more could a man dream of? If only I were ten years younger. It's not good to tease an old man. We both enjoyed laughing at the situation. Let's go, Mr. Simmons. Let's go get some fresh lobsters for dinner. We finished our long necks and walked out the door. The restaurant and food were great. I didn't really like the wine the hostess chose, but I tried to be nice. Did not work out. What's wrong with the wine? Mr. Simmons? Was that obvious? Sorry. It was unintentional. A kind of reflex action. When I was 18, I got drunk like a dog on cheap white wine. Neither before nor after this. Have I ever been so unhappy? Every time I smell or taste white wine, I feel nauseous. I can't explain it. It's good wine, but don't worry about it. Five minutes later, we had two cold ones long necks. Oddly enough, there was little conversation during the meal. Each of us finished the meal with fruit, sherbet, and coffee. Tell me about you. Are you married? Do you have any children? What do you do for a living? We've been here all evening, and I'm dying to know what brought us together. These are a lot of questions. I have two daughters. Both are at Columbia University studying international banking or something like that. Actually, I do not know. I'm just paying tuition. This is interesting. I have a master's degree from Columbia University and am one of their guest lecturers. I have to meet them both. Did you see them this morning? We had lunch together. They hate it when I make them miss classes. You must have gotten married early if you have two girls in college. Sounds like something a guy might say. I felt comfortable with this Mediterranean beauty. I could talk to her all evening. I am currently separated from my wife. Strange words. I never thought I could use it. She left me for a rich schemer. I think he is building shopping centers or business complexes. In any case, he has a luxury car and a large apartment. She said that she decided to change me. The divorce will be final in approximately four weeks. This is a stupid reason to leave a good marriage. I'm guessing everything was fine until she met this guy. Maybe she was never happy with my choice of work. I had several opportunities to advance, but she refused to move, and I wasn't happy about it. But I decided it was necessary to save the marriage. Now, I feel like nothing. And what are you doing? There was an awkward pause on my part. How do you tell a beautiful, rich, successful woman that you are a produce manager at a supermarket? She noticed my discomfort and responded accordingly. It doesn't matter. We can talk about this later. No, it's okay. I'm not ashamed of what I do. It's just that the job of a grocery sales manager in a supermarket is not a job that impresses the ladies. It doesn't bother my daughters, but my wife often purposely forgot to mention it to people. I could tell it was bothering her. Do you like what you do? Yes, and I'm good at it. The waiter brought more coffee and cleared the table. Mr. Simmons, I understand that you have only known me for a short time, but I believe that first impressions are very important. In short, what is your first impression of me? The question put me in an awkward position. If I answered honestly, I might push her away. And if I tried to butter her up, I was sure that she would see right through it and think I was fake. What to do? What to do? In short, 
I see you as beautiful, smart, educated, and confident. Her head was slightly tilted down, and her eyes were looking at me. I noticed a small smirk. I was hoping for some honesty. Sorry, but we had such a pleasant evening that I didn't want to ruin it. Is your true opinion of me really that bad? I don't want you to be offended by me. Maybe that's why your wife left you for another man. If you weren't always trying to please her, your marriage would be stronger. It was mean. But I had to admit that there was some truth to it. Miss Rothberg, I believe that you are cunning and manipulate people. You use your beauty and charm to get what you want. You're used to getting your way. And I feel like you're a bit of a spoiled child. You play with men, but are afraid of commitment. Apparently, you know how to make money as well as spend and invest it wisely. If you weren't so obsessed with proving that you're as good as any man, you'd probably make a good mother. I felt uneasy after saying this, but she made me angry with her comment about my marriage. For a few moments, we just sat and looked at each other. Do you really think I would be a good mother? My mood suddenly improved dramatically on the short drive back to the condo. Everything was pleasant again. I knew she heard everything I said, but she seemed to accept it without any argument. She needed the truth, and I gave it to her. Knowing that she wasn't upset made me feel better about being honest with her. My night as Letitia Rothberg's slave turned out to be a little boring. It's difficult to have love in different bedrooms. Well, okay, because I wasn't expecting anything anyway. The next morning, I was up first to find a breakfast of fruit, Danish pastries, hot coffee, and a copy of the Wall Street Journal waiting for me. The wind died down, and I enjoyed relaxing on the balcony overlooking the Caribbean. I could get used to this. Letitia joined me about twenty minutes later and jokingly snatched part of the newspaper. We sat in silence, reading and sipping coffee as if we had been doing this for years. I knew this woman for less than a day, but everything about her was natural and comfortable. I'm afraid my phone doesn't work here, and I really feel like I should call my daughters. Letitia handed me her mobile phone. Be my guest. Cindy, this is Dad. Where are you? Is everything okay? The mobile says London. I'm in the Caymans and everything is fine. I just thought I'd let you two know that since I didn't go home straight away, I was staying with a friend. I had to use her phone. Last night, your photograph was shown on TV. They showed you getting on a plane with Letitia. Rotberg. What the heck are you doing with Letitia Rotberg? She is my friend with whom I am staying. What's the big deal? Why are you with her? Everything is fine. Nothing devious is happening. I don't understand your concern. Dad, this woman is a barracuda. She eats men for breakfast. Letitia was carrying the breakfast tray from the balcony when she passed by. I couldn't help myself. This is my daughter, Cindy. She is in New York. She said I should be careful because you are a barracuda. Of course, Cindy heard me say this. It flies. And let out a loud groan over the phone. I could make out that Cindy and Sandy were quickly discussing something on the other end. Why are you there? How do you know her? When are you going to come back home? Before I could answer any of her questions, Letitia was already standing with her hand outstretched, waiting for me to hand her the phone. Hello, Cindy. This is Letitia. Your father told me about you and your sister. I'll be in New York tomorrow and would like to have lunch with you, too. Where can I pick you up? Of course. There was no way I could hear the other side of this conversation. Who is this professor? No problem. I'll pick you up from the classroom at 11. Okay. I say goodbye to you. Bye. Letitia returned my mobile phone. Your daughter said goodbye. Tomorrow I will have lunch with them. I promise to be nice, even though they think I'm a fish. She giggled slightly and wagging her butt, went to her room. An hour later, we were at the Federal Reserve Bank of the Cayman Islands under the experienced guidance of the owner. I opened my first offshore bank account, and 20 minutes later, I saw that $1.4 million had been transferred to my new account from Towers and Burns. I decided that was a fair price for a 215-year-old penny. After lunch, she asked a friend to take us to feed the manta rays, this type of stingray. Over dinner, I asked her why she worked for a firm like Towers and Burns and learned that she owned 60% of the company's shares. What else can you tell about yourself? Apparently, you are a major player in the global financial arena, and I'm embarrassed to say 
that I don't know anything about you. I was born and raised in London. My father is Israeli, and my mother is Turkish. I received my MBA from Columbia University. I'm not married, but I've been engaged twice. I haven't had a serious relationship for more than three years. I learned not to trust men who show interest in me. I guess you could say I'm cynical, but it seems to me that most of them want something from me, but they have nothing to offer in return. It is sad. I hope that they'll give you a ride back to the condominium. Does this mean you don't trust me? You have to take this seriously, you big idiot. Sorry if I seemed insensitive. I didn't want this. It's probably hard for me to relate to your problem. I'll try to be better. Okay, let's relax. We need to go to the party. We ended the evening at a cocktail party in one of the large hotels. Everyone knew her and treated her like a celebrity. I spent the evening trying to remain even more inconspicuous than I already was. I was still wearing the city clothes I had worn in New York. I had no idea that I would be traveling to the tropics. At first, Letitia seemed obligated to accompany me, but I convinced her to have fun and let me blend into an environment in which I felt comfortable. She tried, but spent most of the evening constantly checking on me. Anyway, I found myself in conversation with a couple of Latin American gentlemen, cattle ranchers from Argentina. The conversation started with football, and then turned to fishing. At least the conversation was in English for my benefit, I suppose. One of them commented on how attractive Letitia looked, not knowing that I was her escort for the evening. I felt a little flattered. My contribution to the chatter consisted mostly of smiles and nods. I didn't know enough about any of the topics to add anything significant until Ramon Duarte brought up the topic of investing. He was interested in winter wheat. I listened as he explained in detail why he was going to invest a lot of his money in something he clearly knew nothing about. I got the impression that he was quite rich, and I was a little perplexed how he managed it. I usually pride myself on having a poker face, but it seems like I didn't it this time. Mr. Simmons, I can see from the expression on your face that you do not agree with me about investing in winter wheat. I got caught. I had to remain invisible and unheard. My invisibility cloak has failed me. I'm very sorry, Ramon. I'm afraid I'm not an investor and don't understand the complexity of this matter. I called him by his first name because I felt awkward addressing him formally. Maybe so. But I have a feeling that you have your own opinion on this matter. I will pester you until you share it with us. I was trapped. I tried to fake a small smile. I need to drink something fresh for the next hour. The two gentlemen listened intently as an Alabama fruit and vegetable vendor explained that the excellent winter wheat harvest in Alberta and Saskatchewan more than made up for the poor harvest in the States. The Canadian Grain Board leased all available silos in North and South Dakota to store surpluses and even reserved railroad cars of grain for short-term storage. Over the course of the week, winter wheat futures will begin to fall and will continue to fall until the market stabilizes. Both Canada and the States will be forced to unload wheat abroad. I was running out of smart words when Letitia approached Ramon and his friend were flattered that she joined our little group and were truly surprised when she grabbed my hand and led me away. What the heck was that, Gary? We were just talking about food. You know, food. She gave me a small smile, and we left to go back to the condo. The next morning, we flew back to New York, where a group of photographers eagerly awaited her arrival. The courier from Towers and Burns handed me a small package containing the coins I had left behind. We were with Letitia. We said our goodbyes, and I headed to the commuter terminal for my flight back to Huntsville. The divorce, as well as the sale of the house, continued as planned. Phil Williams from the main office left me several messages asking me to call him. They again asked me to consider moving to the company's headquarters in New York. This time I agreed. John Smart also left a message. He wanted to meet for lunch. I cleaned out my locker at work and wished my shift workers good luck. There was a photo in the paper of Clayton and Marcy at a barbecue for one of the local politicians. They looked like the perfect couple. It took me the whole day to scan and identify all the coins in the New York bag, with three weeks left before I left. I decided to list them on eBay as soon as possible. Everything should be fine until I run into some defaulters. It took a full day to post the coins for sale and get all the envelopes and blank labels ready for shipping. 
all the money went into my PayPal account, and from there into my new offshore bank. Now, I had the weekend to relax. My Friday lunch with John Smart was interesting. John was extremely pleased that I had set Clayton up, but was unhappy that I didn't get anything out of the deal. It would be too difficult to explain this to him. The lunch went well, and before leaving, he gave me the deeds to five acres of land on the outskirts of town. He and his wife were leaving for Florida, and he wanted to get the house in order before leaving. No good deed goes without reward. Shortly after John and I broke up, my cell phone rang. Cindy and Sandy arrive in Nashville in two hours. I had enough time to go there and pick them up. Airfare to Nashville was half the price to Huntsville, and the girls had a budget. I got there and picked them up without any problems. On the way home, Cindy couldn't wait to tell me about it. It. The course was held in the lecture hall. Advanced corporate finance for more than 300 students. Halfway through the lecture, the professor stopped to introduce Letitia to the students. She just showed up like she owned the place. She spoke to the class for about 10 minutes and then announced that she needed two students for lunch at the Weston Hotel. We couldn't believe it when she said our names. So you liked her? She's amazing, Dad. How the heck did you manage to meet her? Well, she said she was looking for a slave, and I was her first choice. Sandy hit me on the shoulder. It's not funny. Be serious. Okay. What did you talk about at dinner? She asked about our activities and school affairs. Sandy giggled slightly. She had a lot of questions about you. In fact, Cindy and I agree that she was interested in more than just friendships. I'm ten years older than her, and a couple of dollars poorer. Sorry, girls, but she is completely out of my league, Dad. She can have any man she wants. Why do you think about it and give us a hint? From our point of view, you are perfect. But Letitia Rothberg doesn't know you like we do. Apparently, your mother didn't know me either. For a few minutes, everything was quiet. My remark about their mother sounded like crap in a punch bowl. It was not my intention to turn my daughters against their mother, and I regretted saying what I said. Sorry, girls. It didn't sound right. Your mother is a wonderful woman, and I have no right to say that. Don't worry, Dad. We understand more than you think. Everything was quiet for a few miles. And then, just as we reached the Alabama state line, Sandy's cell phone buzzed. Hello? Pause. We arrived about an hour ago. Everything is fine. Pause. You're kidding. Pause. Sounds great. I'll tell him. Thank you for calling. Bye. In the rearview mirror, I noticed Sandy giving Cindy a thumbs-up sign. What was it? Sandy leaned over the front seat of the car. Guess what, Dad? Letitia flies into Huntsville on Tuesday morning. She said that you owe her for an overnight stay, and she expects breakfast in bed. I was flattered to hear the news, but I felt pressured by Letitia and now my daughters. It all sounded great, and I was hopeful that I would be up to the challenge, and more than one. The weekend with the girls was great. They spent Saturday afternoon with their mother, but never met Clayton. I asked them not to mention it flies. We sorted out all the things they wanted to keep. By the time they left, we had everything settled. I prepaid for storage until they graduated from school. When we drove back to Nashville, they made me promise to try to be friendly with Letitia. When I asked them what they meant, Cindy said, Just don't make her angry. It was simple enough. They were happy about my moving to the city. I still didn't understand that. It flies when you need it from an old man who doesn't even have an Armani suit. When I got home, it was time to relax with a beer and the Sunday paper. This week there were no photos of Marcy and Clayton, but there was a small note about Keystone Development having trouble financing a local project. Futures for winter wheat fell in price to a record level. It was interesting. I called Terry Davis and asked him to come. It wasn't lunch, but I figured we could talk over a couple of beers. Clayton Manning has had a checkered past, to say the least. He's been either broke or big for the last few years. He spent a lot of time moving to stay ahead of creditors and friends who lent him money. His new project began to fail. The people and investors who supported him disappeared. I never remembered beer tasting so good. Monday morning. Turned out better than expected. The coins I put up for auction sold much better than I expected. Cookson estimated the value of the coins at approximately $300,000. It didn't look like they would rise that high, 
but they were on track to exceed 200,000. In a little more than two weeks, I will become a free. Three months ago, this would have seemed terrible to me, but today, I was looking forward to it. The people who bought the house had agreed on financing and were ready to close. I thought it was funny that Marcy felt so comfortable with Clayton that she didn't need any of our shared possessions. I wondered if she realized how slippery her future was at 3 o'clock. I had a meeting with the people who bought the house. The check for 200000 was immediately deposited into my offshore account. They didn't mind me staying in the house for another week. This suited both of us. The next morning, before I had time to drink my coffee, the phone rang. An unknown person formally notified me that Mrs. Rothberg would be arriving at 10.45 a.m. on Delta Flight 724. I 30 minutes early? Yes. I was a little worried. One way or another, several paparazzi found out about her arrival and were waiting at the terminal. I tried best to be invisible. I parked my car in a short-term parking lot because I didn't expect such attention. Instead of waiting for me to pick her up, she decided to walk with me to the car. Of course, the photographers remembered my car license plate number, and the cat jumped out of the bag. I'm not used to this kind of fuss, but Letitia didn't seem bothered at all. She apologized to me for this on the way home. I couldn't help but think that when she got off the plane, I wanted to kiss her stupid old man. I was embarrassed by the meager furnishings in the house. Over the past few months, I have gotten rid of everything I could. Only the essentials remained for which the new owner agreed to take responsibility after my departure. My guests seemed amused by my attempts to apologize. There was nothing in the house to eat, so we made a quick trip to the local Taco Bell. Her choice for dinner. I promised her dreamland ribs. It was nice to be around a woman who had a healthy appetite. Letitia, I'm glad you're here, but I don't understand why. I figured you'd get back to business. This is business, stupid. I understand you're moving to New York next week. You need somewhere to stay, and I have a spare bedroom. I'm here to help you pack your things. Tomorrow morning, a truck will arrive to transport everything you can't fit in the car. Just no furniture, please. How did you know that I was moving? That's what I do. If I pay attention to the little things, the big things come naturally. This is complete nonsense but I always wanted to say it. Are you in cahoots with my daughters? I tried to smile innocently when I said this, but it was difficult for the old man to appear cunning. Her offer was unexpected, but I couldn't think of a single reason to refuse it. Certainly. Now let's grab some boxes, so can start packing. I thought she would have been more comfortable sitting in a boardroom or in a bank somewhere, but she seemed to enjoy just being with me. I still felt a little awkward about the age difference. We ended up throwing away more things than we collected. She had definite opinions about my wardrobe and refused to listen to my pleas for mercy. As soon as I got settled in New York, she promised to take me to the store for suitable clothes. When we were done, there were more boxes than could fit in my car, but not enough for the moving van. I was hoping she ordered a small truck. I put my laptop and small inkjet printer aside to sort out the items on eBay. We were about to go out to dinner, when a new surprise appeared. An RV was parked in front of the house. Later, she watched as a driver in an elegant uniform descended from the cab with a tablet. Are you Gary Simmons? Yes. I have a delivery for you. Where should you put it? What the heck is their car? This is from Mr. Ramon Duarte. Do you have space in the garage? The space in the garage where Marcy's Volvo had once been parked was empty. I pointed in that direction and nodded my head. I noticed Letitia put her hand to her mouth and giggled. I don't know for sure, but I think she was amused by my confusion. Five minutes later, I was looking at the shiny orange sports car parked next to my outdated Volvo. What the heck is this? With great pride, the courier said. This is a 2008 Lamborghini Gallardo Spider, a Super Legera model. Isn't this the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? Letitia could hardly contain her laughter. She wasn't loud or anything, but she definitely enjoyed it. I signed the delivery form so the elegant uniform can go home. I had no idea what I was going to do with my gift, but I knew I wasn't going to take it with me to New York. Get in the Volvo, little Miss Funny Pants. My guest was still smiling as we pulled out of the driveway. I ordered a full order of ribs and two fosters. 
Would you be so kind as to explain what the story is with the car? Ramon didn't have time to buy winter wheat. Everyone thought he was crazy. When the price began to fall, he began doubling the contracts in less than a week. He earned more than $40 million. He was happy with the money, but he was ecstatic with the comments he received about his smart move. Well, good for Ramon. I just hope he didn't mention my name. He wanted to give you credit, but not without your approval. He thanked me for bringing you to the party and asked for your address. However, I didn't know he was going to do this. The ribs arrived, and I watched in fascination as Letitia dipped a few of them in Tabasco before eating. God, I love this girl. You know that. I'm going to send him back in the morning, right? I thought so. Do not worry about it. Ramon won't be offended. He would have gladly you money, but he probably thought you would refuse. This way, you'll feel a little more obligated to leave the money because of the Tabasco. We were forced to order a few more bottles of beer. I felt good and didn't want to go home. At this moment, I would give anything in the world to spend the night in bed with this beautiful young vixen. I envied the suave, gallant boy lovers who could get any girl in the world into bed in five minutes. The best I could hope for was a kiss goodnight. We couldn't talk all evening, so eventually I had to go home. The next morning was simply wonderful. All my worries were in vain. As soon as we entered the house, Letitia took my hand and led me to the bedroom. Because I was a true gentleman, I did my best to make sure her needs were met first. I was rewarded with the greatest night of love of my solitary life. Breakfast in bed consisted of juice coffee and Danish pastries. I'm very sorry, but under the circumstances, this is the best I can offer. This is the best I could hope for. Trying to eat from a tray in bed is very uncomfortable. After a few giggles and rearrangements, we retreated to the kitchen. Breakfast in bed sounds neater than it actually is. Letitia, I don't want to ruin the mood but I'm really wondering why you chose me. I have little to offer, and you deserve so much. I've been burned many times by clever, gallant boy lovers. I won't fall into this trap again. I understand. I am attracted to you because I am not slick or gallant. My guests thought it was funny and laughed a little. Gary, I was impressed by the deal you made in New York with James. I was just selling a few coins. Not that stupid. I found your proposed land trust donation agreement intriguing. Do you believe that I am a philanthropist? Not at all. I see. As a cunning jerk who took advantage of a unique situation despite his wife's lover? Of course. This brought a smile to my face. I was amazed at how smart she was and how well she hid it. Was it wrong? No, Gary. It was brilliant. I was impressed and wanted to know more about you. You couldn't have known in New York what? I was up to. I knew what you did, but I didn't find out why until a few days later. Have you checked me? Of course. I'm not stupid. I have to admit that the boost in self-esteem was refreshing. Unfortunately, Letitia flew to New York early in the morning. I hated to see her leave. She left me with a happy heart and a key to her apartment. The Lamborghini dealer was only able to come pick up the car the next day. It was okay, because I didn't intend to ride it. The movers arrived in a small truck and took my belongings to leave for New York. Terry Davis called to say that Keystone Development was having serious financial problems. It seemed that Clayton had mysteriously lost almost all of his investors almost overnight. There were rumors that some people were taking deposits that Clayton had outstanding. That evening, my almost ex-wife visited me. To what do I owe this unexpected pleasure? I couldn't resist sarcasm. I need to talk to you about some things. I'm leaving in a few days but I will help you in any way I can. I wanted to borrow my old Volvo, but I noticed that it wasn't there. What is that? Orange car in the garage? Things were starting to get interesting. Sorry, Marcy. When you said you didn't want your old Volvo, I sold it back to the dealer. He might still have it if you want to check. Crap. I've never heard Marcy use that term before. The orange car was a gift. But I will still return it tomorrow. I can't imagine myself driving something like that. The sticker on the window said $225,000. Who could give you such a gift? Your new friend? No. It was a cattle farmer from Argentina, whom I helped a few weeks ago. He just wanted to show his gratitude. So, what else can I help you with? There was a pause in the conversation. 
I realized that Marcy wanted to say something else, but did not know how. Do it. Would you like something to drink? I have a beer and some diet soda. No, I can't linger. How did you even get here? I don't see the car. I took a taxi. Gary, you said you were leaving in a few days. Is it okay if I stay in the house for a while? The house has been sold. We closed the deal yesterday, and the new owners will be moving their belongings this weekend. They allowed me to stay until Friday, but nothing more. What's wrong with an apartment by the river? She didn't answer this question. There was a short lull, and then she asked, What happened to the money you received for the house? Now things were getting really interesting. I was starting to enjoy how this conversation was developing. Everything has gone. You made it clear that you don't need any of this. I used the money. I had to buy a new apartment where I would move. Where are you moving to? To New York. I received a promotion and a big increase in salary. I should be there on Monday. I wasn't going to tell Marcy that I was going to live with Letitia. I also wasn't going to tell her about the bank account in Cayman. You never told me what happened to the apartment. It was only rented. The lease had expired and the owner did not want to renew it. Where do you live now? We're staying at the Holiday Inn until Clayton finds a new place to live. I see. Now I understood why she wanted to move into our old house. Marcy looked a little confused. She wanted to ask for help, but didn't know how to approach it. I realized that she was in trouble. There was a lull in the conversation again. Is there anything else I can do for you? Could you give me a ride back to the holiday in the first half of the trip, passed in silence? I understand that you have a girlfriend. Tell me about her. She's not really a friend, but rather a business partner. What kind of business? You are not doing any business. You're right. I'm just a grocery clerk. I can't fool you, can I? Marcy fell silent. She was looking out the window, and I heard her whisper to herself, Jerk. This was the moment when I could let out all my frustration. This was the perfect opportunity to let her know how much the photographs in the newspapers had affected me. But instead, I just smiled to myself. She was in a sorry state, and I was rewarded for a moment. I felt uneasy, but it quickly passed. I dropped her off at the motel entrance. She left without ever looking back or saying goodbye. I hate to admit it, but I felt a little satisfaction. It's been a good week. On Thursday morning, I unexpectedly received divorce papers. They arrived ahead of schedule. But who am I to complain? On the front page of the Huntsville newspaper was a photograph of Letitia Rothberg arriving at the airport. Your humble servant held her hand. A copy of the newspaper is delivered free of charge to each room at the Holiday Inn. Marcy can read it over breakfast. I was sure that Clayton would explain to her who Letitia was. I emptied the safe deposit box at the bank. My seven pennies will come in handy in the near future. I thought Letitia would ask about them while she was here, but she never brought it up. All our conversations were purely secular. If she was interested in me for business reasons, she never mentioned it. I have included a buy-it-now price on all coins offered for auction. More than half of them were sold at that price. I spent the rest of the day packing up the coins that were sold and getting them ready to go to the post office. The remaining auctions were scheduled to close before noon on Friday. If all people payments go through, then all coins will be mailed the same day. Any unscrupulous buyers will have to wait until Monday. I was on the road early Saturday morning. Most of the money from my PayPal account was transferred to my account in Cayman. I also left a small amount in PayPal in case I saw something I absolutely had to have. The people who bought the house arrived just as I was leaving. It was beneficial for both of us. The trip to the north will take about 12 hours without delay. Letitia was at home and promised to prepare a home-cooked dinner for my arrival. I wondered who would cook it. It was nice to know that I was still man enough to win the heart of such a beauty. I had no doubt that I could meet all her expectations. I had just crossed the Virginia State Line on Highway 81 when Cindy called. Looks like Clayton Manning has skipped town and left Marcy with no car, no place to live, no money, and a big motel bill. I asked Cindy what she thinks I should do. She laughed and replied, Smile.